I think uh, Ira, everyone's now logged in. Ira, are you able to show the people on the screen? It's not a huge group. Uh, sure, we can pull everybody up if you'd like. Yeah, I think it would be good. You agree, buddy? There's like 15 people. Okay. All right. Uh, you'll be receiving messages to uh, join as panelists. So please uh, feel free to turn on your cameras and make this more interactive session. Uh, so I'll work on that and I'll hand it off to Dr. Small at this time. Okay, so we'll wait for everybody to join us and open your cameras if you like. It will start in a minute. Okay, we'll, we'll just start momentarily. Ira is trying to be able to create a situation where we can see each other. Okay, we're gonna start in a moment. So as Ira does this, I, I suspect everybody can hear me. Uh, just to let everybody know, today at 11 a.m. New York time, no, sorry, at 1, 1 p.m. New York time and 6 o'clock in the UK and 8 o'clock in Israel. Uh, 2 p.m. today. 2 p.m. The course is at 2 p.m.? Yes. Hello, Ellen. <laughs> nice to see you. Wonderful to see you, Charles. Hope you're doing well. Thank you. You too. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. So you, you should be able to turn on your cameras and join us. So it's a small group and it could be a bit more interactive. So welcome, everybody. So as we're coming on, so at 2 p.m. New York time, 7 p.m. in... Um, UK at 9 p.m. in Israel. I'm starting a four-part lecture uh, course that begins today and tomorrow Professor David Patterson will also start a special course as well. These are four-part lectures. We'll be meeting once a week and this will become a, a common feature at ISGAP. There'll be courses that will be offered mostly by our research fellows. There's Ev Ev Evan. Hello. <laughs> Yeah. Evans, our new director of development, and El Shaday is there. She's working with on programming, and most people know Ira, who coordinates all the all of our work. Okay, so I think we'll start, and I think people who are listening, you now have the option to join us with your camera if you wish. Okay, so Ira, do you want to put up the screen? of Benny's talk or, okay, cool, thank you. Okay, so very quickly, it's really, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome Benny Weinthal back to ISGAP. Benny has been uh, in the struggle against anti-Semitism and for human rights for a long time, for many years. And I, I think I met Benny in Berlin probably not to, I guess about 12, 13 years ago, and he was engaged in the struggle against anti-Semitism and reactionary social movements back, back then, reactionary social movements in Iran, the Middle East, and in Europe, and in Germany. Uh, Benny Weinthal is this, a distinguished journalist based in Berlin and Jerusalem. He's a research fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and the European correspondent for the Jerusalem Post. His work has appeared in the uh, BBC, The Guardian, Slate Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, um, The National Review Online, and many other prestigious publications. And Benny has recently uh, published an important book 
dealing with issues of uh, the delegitimization uh, of Israel and the BDS movement. And today's lecture by Benny uh, is Germany, Germany's battle against the BDS and the delegitimization of Israel. So Benny, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. Um, and, and thanks to everybody who registered for the panel. I hope everyone is coping as best as possible with the, uh, with the pandemic. I'd also like to thank uh, Ira Guberman from ISCAP who helped organize uh, this webinar and El Shadeh Abraham from ISCAP who uh, also played a role in, in um, bringing about this webinar. Um, I'm gonna talk for about 20 minutes um, and then we'll have questions and answers um, since we have a small group, uh, we'll have, I, I hope, a fair amount of time to delve into uh, the uh, give and take because uh, good questions are, are better than good answers, especially in the, in the field of uh, contemporary anti-Semitism. Um, what I'm going to cover, broadly speaking, is the, um, the German anti-BDS resolution. BDS stands for boycott, divestment, sanctions, and that's a movement slash campaign um, organized to um, target Israel. And uh, they claim secure concessions, that is the advocates of BDS claim to secure concessions from the Israeli government to help Palestinians. Others uh, claim it's a movement to uh, bring about the dissolution of the Israeli state. And I will uh, delve into the, sort of the highlights and the lowlights of uh, the, re the response to the anti-BDS resolution, uh, the criticisms and the praise. And <clears throat> I will also cover um, some of the, some, the role of um, Iran and uh, Hezbollah in the BDS movement in Germany, as well as um, and I think this is the, um, the heart on, in, on many levels of my monograph, um, which if folks need, um, ISCAP will uh, include in the, uh, in the webinar, in the chat uh, section, so you can access it at the end of the talk. It's online at, FD, at FTD, on FTD's website, excuse me. Um, and the heart of the F, of my monograph is really the um, I think the the recommendations, the policy recommendations, at the coattail of the monograph or the conclusion uh, that outline what both the U.S. and Germany can do to um, intensify their um, their efforts to um, stymie uh, BDS. So. That's the general outline, and I'll start with <clears throat> just a little bit about my background. Uh, BDS was formally um, codified as a movement in, in 2005, um, and BDS announced its program back then. Um, a few years later, when I was living in Berlin, um, I um, was involved in um, reporting on some uh, trade union activities, and uh, I conducted an interview with the head of the uh, German trade union movement, which would be the equivalent of being the head of the AFL or before the AFL CIO, if folks remember, uh, broke up, it would be the equivalent of uh, the AFL CIO in Germany, Michael Sommer, and I interviewed him about the BDS movement. So back then I, I recognized that this is, this is something dangerous um, and it could potentially, uh, the movement garner a lot of traction in Europe. The head of the German trade union movement came out against BDS um, and equated it with, with Germany's um, <clears throat> past, uh, it's during the Hitler movement. So he took a very strong line. Um, he has since retired. And as a result of that, my interview with the head of the German trade union movement, Stuart Applebaum in New York City, who is the president of the retail wholesale department store workers union and the head of the Jewish uh, labor committee, um, organized a letter uh, of all the American trade unions 
uh, and their opposition to BDS. So as early as 2007, um, there was a fair amount of opposition among the German and um, American trade unions in contrast to uh, other trade unions, mainly in South Africa, Scandinavia, uh, France, Britain, who uh, jumped on the, the pro BDS bandwagon. Um, now, I, I was, it was a very difficult time to get articles in the German media at that time about BDS, warning about the dangers. One editor from a large German paper simply told me, um, we don't want to uh, write a report on this because it could draw attention to BDS and BDS could grow, um, of course, or gain potency. Now that I, I didn't find that very convincing. So most of my articles at the time during the nascent phase of the BDS campaign in, in Europe were in the uh, German Jewish uh, media or <clears throat> in um, the Israeli uh, in the Jerusalem Post. But this editor, I think, you know, summed up a view that uh, he, he's, although I disagreed with him, he's on to something when, <clears throat> when he noted his, his um, anxiety, I should say, about uh, drawing attention to BDS. Um, it's something equivalent to that, that famous uh, Hemingway line in For Whom the Bell Tolls, and I'll just paraphrase it. There are many who do not know they are anti-Semites, but will find out when the time comes. Um, or the, the famous Brecht line from his play, The Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui, quote, um, where Brecht writes, um, the nations put him where his kind belong, but don't rejoice too soon at your escape. The womb he crawled from is still going strong. So in this case, the womb he crawled from is still growing strong, could be, for example, the, uh, the legacy of uh, 12 years of German fascism and the economic boycott against Jewish businesses that uh, helped launch uh, the Hitler movement or played a role, I should say, in the, in the early phase of uh, the Hitler movement during uh, uh, when, when Hitler was chancellor. So um, I, I, I'll move on to now the BDS resolution and, and the highlights and the lowlights of the resolution and the anti-BDS struggle in the Federal Republic of Germany in terms of what's happened since 2019. 2019, the Bundestag, Germany's parliament uh, passed a resolution against BDS with the overwhelming support of um, the most of the mainstream parties. That is the Chancellor Merkel's party, the Christian Democratic Union, her sister party, the Christian uh, um, the, the, the Christian Democratic Party, excuse me, the Christian Social Union, her, her sister party in Bavaria, the Social Democratic Party, that's Merkel's coalition party in the government, the Green Party and the Free Democrats. There are some other parties that had different resolutions, some stronger, some weaker, um, to to either to oppose BDS, but um, those those resolutions didn't um, gain the the uh, the stat the didn't win over the other parties. Now this resolution is imp it's important to stress it's a non-binding resolution, so it doesn't have any legal um, consequences. The resolution states, I'm quoting, the arguments and methods of the BDS uh, movement are anti-Semitic. The resolution continues, and I'm quoting, um, explained or said that the tactics of the BDS campaign, and here I'm quoting, excuse me, inevitably arouse association with the Nazi slogan, Kauf nicht bei Juden, don't buy from Jews. So you have a, a very strong uh, declaration um, opposed to BDS and that uh, links the resolution to Germany's um, uh, horrible history during the 12 years of fascism. And the resolution also talks about um, discouraging uh, uh, financing, governmental financing of BDS. Um, so this was in a sense groundbreaking because at the time, uh, no other parliament in the world had uh, declared um, BDS to be uh, contaminated with anti-Semitism and also 
declared BDS to be um, a um, part of the, you know, on the spectrum of Nazism. Um, now, there have been uh, other parliaments since then that have uh, reached the same conclusion. I should say one other parliament, Austria, last year. And of course, the US uh, State Department, Senator, Secretary of State Pompeo declared BDS to be anti-Semitic. Um, now, the what's interesting about this resolution also is um, there was, excuse me, some opposition um, from German politicians within the mainstream parties to the anti-BDS resolution. So there was some friction. Uh, Norbert Rodkin from Merkel's party, who's an influential um, member of parliament, uh, expressed opposition. Um, Niels Annen, who's a deputy secretary of uh, state or deputy foreign minister from the Social Democrats, um, also showed a lack of enthusiasm toward the resolution. And there were also some Green Party um, members uh, who also expressed uh, opposition. Now, BDS anti-Semitism uh, in Germany is uh, largely a problem of Germany, German cultural NGOs, um, for example, theaters um, and different um, um, artistic groups, German funded NGOs in uh, Israel or in the uh, disputed Palestinian territories are also uh, who pr also promote BDS and many of these NGOs have ties to uh, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a US and EU designated terrorist organization. And then of course, there's Germany's uh, appalling UN anti-Israeli voting record, um, which critics say is also part of Germany's uh, pro-BDS campaign, or I should say pro-delegitimization campaign of Israel. And Germany's ambassador to the UN, Christoph Heusken, who was previously on the UN Security Council for two years until the end of last year, uh, used a, a significant amount of his time to uh, trash Israel at the UN Security Council and vote against Israel. The Simon Wiesenthal Center included Heusken on its list of the 10 worst outbreaks of anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli conduct in 2019 because he equated during a UN Security Council debate, uh, Heusken equated Israel's conduct in um, defending itself against Hamas rocket attacks from the Hamas controlled Gaza Strip with uh, um, um, Israel. So in a sense, uh, Heusken, this, the UN ambassador, Germany's UN ambassador said H Hamas, the U EU and US designated terrorist movement is on the same level as um, the democratic Jewish state of Israel. Um, so this type of equivalency was viewed by the Wiesenthal Center as a form of stripping Israel of its um, existence. Um, and Germany's voting pattern has, has not, there's been a slight change, a couple of uh, votes that were, um, where they reversed themselves and, and did not vote against Israel, but uh, over, since uh, Heusken was included on the list and the Germans protested vehemently, I should say, against the inclusion of him on this list. But overall, Germany's UN voting record remains uh, largely anti-Israel and uh, they haven't uh, seemed to uh, internalize uh, the, the lessons, I should say, of, uh, of what uh, their assaults on, on Israel mean at, in, this, in this forum. Now the resolution did get praise, the, the BDS resolution, um, the anti-BDS resolution from the United States and the Israeli government, along with, I think, um, all the major Jewish organizations. Um, one important Jewish, uh, American Jewish leader told me the, the vote was important because it was able, because one was able to leverage it all over the, the world to degrade BDS. Um, but at the same time, um, 
there, there has been some criticism. Um, critics have argued, as I mentioned uh, at the outset of this uh, talk, that the, that the resolution is sort of a paper tiger. It has no teeth and it's largely symbolic because of its nine binding nature. And um, it's, it's turned out to be a, uh, um, a way to um, uh, hoodwink people as uh, the Israeli uh, correspondent for Israel Hayom in Germany, Eldad Beck wrote just a few weeks ago in Israel Hayom, Israel's largest paper, he wrote how Germany tricked Jewish organizations worldwide uh, with this resolution. Um, and his main argument was, um, and I'm quoting from him, but despite the importance of the move, which influenced more countries to adopt similar decisions, what remained hidden was the fact that the resolution had no legal and practical validity. It was merely a recommendation. Besides the fact that many left-wing parties in the Bundestag voted against the decision, the initiative's very purpose was to block a more radical right-wing proposal that demanded a complete ban on BDS activities in Germany. The vote drew immediate public criticism from BDS supporters, including um, Israelis, Jews, journalists, and former ambassador himself. They claimed the decision was a violation of the, of the principle of freedom of expression, and so on and so on. That was the, uh, as I mentioned, some of the criticism from, from Eldad Beck um, about why this uh, anti-BDS resolution was more of a um, following his his argument, a theater of, of absurd and a way of, um, as he pointed out, tricking those who who uh, who supported him. Um, and uh, in his in his uh, piece, he urges obviously a, a more uh, robust uh, um, policy against uh, BDS in in Germany. Now, one other criticism I should add came from uh, uh, the former ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, um, who played a critical role in, uh, I think, um, under undercutting BDS in Germany. Richard Grinnell then went on to become the uh, acting director of national intelligence for the United States government. And he argued once the BDS resolution passed in a uh, comment to me, that the German government should now apply the BDS, the anti-BDS resolution to the Iranian regime, um, which, which would be the maximum remedy, I think, of the, the BDS, the anti-BDS resolution. Because the Iranian regime is obviously part and parcel of the BDS uh, movement. And Grinnell recognized this quickly. And uh, Rick Grinnell is uh, obviously a very, very sharp, a foreign policy thinker and uh, told me in, in my article that uh, the BDS resolution should apply to Iran and Hezbollah. And um, I reported on this at, at the time in the Jerusalem Post. Rick Grinnell also told me very early on, and I reported on this in the Jerusalem Post, that all financial institutions should not conduct business with BDS entities. So banks, online payment, uh, uh, payment platforms like PayPal, et cetera, should pull the plug on uh, business with BDS. So again, Grinnell was thinking from sort of an industry-wide perspective um, in a much more uh, sophisticated way uh, than um, what was taking place in Germany at, 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 at that point. Um, so that was sort of an, another criticism, but of course, Grinnell welcomed the, the anti-BDS resolution, but he wanted uh, Germany to tackle um, BDS within the context of other, within, within the context of terrorism groups, because in Germany, the Iranian regime controls a center in Hamburg called the Islamic Center in, a, in the Northern German city that buses people to an annual demonstration called the Al-Quds demonstration in Berlin. Al-Quds uh, means Jerusalem, and it's a uh, the Al-Quds demonstration takes place each year. It's a regime, Iranian regime uh, event calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. And this event is filled with BDS activists. And again, we have uh, clear evidence, and I've been reporting on this now for, for well over a decade, 
that Iran's regime, which owns the uh, Islamic Center, is uh, uh, deeply involved in promoting BDS, along with uh, Hezbollah members and supporters in Germany who are also part of the, the BDS campaign in Germany. Now, the most dangerous forms of anti-Semitism in Germany are um, um, obviously Islamic animated anti-Semitism coming from Iran, uh, Iranian regime supporters, Hezbollah, um, Sunni-based uh, Islamic uh, radicalism and right-wing extremism, left-wing extremism, um, as well as um, this notion of um, guilt defensiveness, anti-Semitism. Um, I'll, I'll explain that quickly. But the point I want to make is that the BDS movement in Germany unifies all these different strands of anti-Semitism. When you look at who's supporting BDS, the three ma major neo-Nazi parties in Germany all support BDS. Again, I've written about this for the Jerusalem Post, the MPD, the National Democratic Party of Germany, the right, that's the name of the party, and the third way, all three uh, neo-Nazi parties have issued support um, of, of BDS and the de delegitimization of Israel. Now, the, the most widespread form of anti-Semitism, and this, I think, also um, helps uh, give a shot in the arm at times to BDS, is this notion of guilt defensiveness anti-Semitism. Now, that's a very uh, fancy sociological term that was um, developed by two German Jewish uh, Marxist philosophers, Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer. Um, and the idea is, and I'm grossly so, you know, I'm oversimplifying this on some level, but the, the rough idea is that in response to the Holocaust, that is post Holocaust, um, Germans were filled with uh, a sense of pathological guilt about the crimes they were complicit in or family members, the descendants of uh, Germans who uh, carried out the Shoah were also, are also and were filled with pathological guilt. And in response to this uh, guilt, uh, Germans would blame Jews uh, for anti-Semitism, would uh, blame Israel for, you know, for crimes it, it did not commit or uh, engage in intense criticism of Israel and Jews that uh, you don't see targeting any other countries. Um, in order to purge this pathological guilt, it, it was a form of relief. And this is why you see such a high level of anti-Israeli attitudes in Germany, I would argue, uh, in contrast to other uh, Western European democracies. Now, this notion was neatly captured by an Israeli psychoanalyst, Zivi Rex, the notion of secondary anti-Semitism, when he famously said, I think in the late 80s, the Germans will never forgive the Jews for Auschwitz. Um, now, he meant that in sarcastic terms, but he was, he was um, trying to shed light on this notion of guilt defensiveness, anti-Semitism. I would now argue, and I've written about this, um, that this notion of guilt defensiveness, anti-Semitism has spread and it's largely contaminated large swaths of Western Europe where Western Europeans won't forgive the Israel for the Holocaust. And that's why you see such high levels of BDS activities in the Scandinavian countries, France, and other countries that played a role in, uh, in advancing uh, the Holocaust. Now, um, I think I'm um, running out of time here as usual. Um, so I just want to touch on um, what's happened, um, and, I'll, and I'll quickly go through this, since the BDS resolution has passed. I think this is very instructive. There's been a backlash against the anti-BDS resolution, um, and it, the German elites this past, in 2020, launched an all-out assault on the anti-BDS the anti re resolution to re-legitimize BDS, and an initiative of uh, German elite cultural organizations, um, over two dozen, including the Goethe Institute, the Federal Cultural Foundation, the Berlin Deutsches Theater, the German Academic 
Arts Artists Exchange, the Berlin the Berliner Festspiele, the Einstein Forum, all these groups, many of them received tremendous amounts of funding, wrote a, um, a protest statement basically saying there shouldn't have been this anti-BDS resolution, it quashes free speech, um, and um, attempted in this, in this initiative to uh, mainstream BDS. Again, this was a huge deal because this is, these are the elites of the, um, the German cultural establishment and receive and it received generous funding from the uh the federal government also the german uh top learned german diplomat andreas gorgon the federal the foreign ministry director general for cultural affairs was tweeting out uh, pro bds articles this year i i first exposed this his tweets in the jerusalem post and a number of german outlets picked up my article and it was discussed in the bundestag he and these elite German cultural institutions were included in this year's uh, or 2020's uh, Wiesenthal list of the top 10 outbreaks of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel Israeli conduct because of their support for BDS. Also three MPs from the Bundestag, Omid Noripour, who sits from the Green Party, Aydan Ozogus from the Social Democrats and Christina Buchholz, from the left party are on the advisory board of a German a BDS organization called the German Palestinian Society. They've helped, in my view, mainstream BDS in Germany. They refused uh, to resign from the board after a fellow politician resigned. And lastly, the Young Socialist Organization recently um, adopted a, um, a resolution uh, with the Fatah youth organization that calls for BDS and the dissolution of Israel. Um, both the USOs and the three German MPs were also included in the uh, Wiesenthal list uh, uh, last year as part of this um, um, outbreak of anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism. So there's been a, a, a you can see a, a bit of a, a, a strong movement against the anti-BDS resolution. And lastly, and I'm, I'm coming to the end here so we can open up for questions. Um, the resolutions which you can, or excuse me, my policy recommendations, which you can find at the end of my BDS monograph, um, I think, as I mentioned, are, are the heart of this monograph and are, um, um, I think, you know, would, would help um, control or at least uh, better blunt BDS in Germany because it is it is a strong movement and anti-Israeli uh, delegitimization is quite potent in Germany. We see that because every few days there seems to be a new anti-Semitism commissioner appointed to fight anti-Semitism. I think almost all the German states currently have an anti-Semitism commissioner. There's a federal anti-Semitism commissioner. There are four anti-Semitism commissioners just in the state of Berlin. All of this helps explain that Germany is in a defensive posture against, in terms of fighting anti-Semitism. They're not, in this sense, making progress. Um, contra on the contrary, it's a, it's a very defensive posture right now. And um, we see that um, in, in terms of Merkel's pro-Iranian regime policy. Yes, Germany did ban Hezbollah activities, but if you look at the, the number of anti-Semitic incidents, if you look at the attitude surveys, and if you look at uh, Chancellor Merkel's pro-Iranian regime po uh, policy, including the large amount of business trade with Iran's regime, um, that suggests um, that Germany is, is not doing enough. Iran's regime, according to the US State Department, both under the Obama and Trump administrations is the top state sponsor of terrorism. The Trump administration officials, I should say the State Department officials within the Trump administration have declared uh, Iran's regime to be the leading state sponsor of Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. The Anti-Defamation League has also said that in a congressional hearing. And at the same time, Germany has helped mainstream this regime in Tehran by boosting trade with Iran and um, honoring its regime uh, at the Tehran, at, at Iran's embassy in Berlin um, for the, uh, on the event of the Islamic revolution, the uh, German secretary, the German foreign ministry sends 
diplomats each year to honor Iran's Islamic revolution. Clearly it does not send a message to the German population that the German government opposes um, <clears throat> the top state sponsor of Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism when there's this type of activity, including the German president who congratulated Iran's regime on its uh, revolution in the name of the German people. So the policy recommendations I recommend are listed. There's, um, I believe I have now um, a total of uh, 17 for the, um, the German government. I also listed some for the US and I will just quickly uh, run through this and we will open up for questions. Um, the first recommendation is um, the Bundestag should ensure that no facilities under its administration are made available to the organizations that are anti-Semitic question Israel's right to exist. The chancellor should instruct, this is number two, the special commissioner for combating anti-Semitism to review federal appropriations for compliance with the Bundespledge, Bundestag's pledge not to fund any projects or organizations that call for boycotting Israel or that challenge its right to exist. Should note the federal commissioner for anti-Semitism, Felix Klein, did come out against a BDS scholar last year from South Africa, uh, who's based in South Africa, who wanted to uh, speak at an event. And that was a, 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 an encouraging move. But at the same time, the federal commissioner, Felix Klein, has not called for the German MPs who are on this pro BDS group to resign. And the, the federal commissioner has not called for Merkel's government to stop doing business with Iran. And he has also not uh, classified Iran's regime as a top state sponsor of Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. Anti Felix Klein has gone to great lengths just to avoid all criticism of Iran. And he's been criticized for that. The Bundestag number three should actively encourage all state cities, municipalities and public actors to adopt po policies comparable to its own. The government should suspend the application of the EU labeling policy for Israeli settlement goods until Brussels creates a single standard for disputed territories. That's number four. Number five, the government should prohibit all PFLP, DFLP, Hamas, Palestinian, Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah activities and deny entry to all individuals with terrorist ties. The government, that's number five, six, the government should introduce legislation that prohibits companies such as Kuwait Airways from practicing discriminatory, discriminatory anti-Israeli policies inside Germany. Moving on to seven, German ministry, uh, Germany's Ministry of Finance should provide more explicit guidance to banks and other financial service providers regarding the accounts of pro-BDS and anti-Semitic organizations. Number eight, German leadership should head the global response in repudiating the false narrative and deceptive terminology that BDS employs to demonize Israel. Number nine, Germany should encourage other European countries to adopt anti-BDS measures. 10, Germany should mandate the history of boycott anti-animated anti-Semitism be included in German school textbooks. 11, Germany should embrace the US State Department's working definition of anti-Semitism. 12, Germany should use its leadership role in the European Union to discourage other EU members from adopting pro-BDS resolutions. Germany should communicate with its private sector companies regarding corporate social responsibility definitions and should insist that pro-BDS platforms and those definitions be eliminated. That was number 13. 14, Germany should adopt anti-BDS resolutions similar to those adopted by many in the United States. That includes, for example, the, the resolutions that allow state pension funds in the US to divest from companies engaged in pro-BDS activity, pro activity. 15, Germany should establish a joint memorandum of understanding between the US, Israel, and Germany to share information on commercial boycotts against targeting Israel. 16, Germany should build on existing joint efforts with the United States to address the broader threat posed by anti-Semitism. 17, leaders of the relevant Bundestag committee should explore working with their American counterparts to establish an interparliamentary working group focused on BDS and anti-Semitism. Anti to my knowledge, none of these 17 resolutions have been adopted or pursued by Germany or its federal commissioner for anti-Semitism, Felix Klein. Um, so I think that also puts a question mark over how serious Germany is in terms of its anti-BDS resolution, its non-binding resolution. So with that, I'll end and open up for uh, questions. Okay, Benny, thank you very much for an important presentation. Uh, I'll take the prerogative of asking the first question and then we will open it up to everybody here. 
So Benny, very briefly, you mentioned Felix Klein's um, inertia, or he's not taking a strong position on, on these matters. Could you explain what, what is the agenda? Why isn't he taking a strong position, number one? And number two, we've also discussed this in the past with the, the coordinator on anti-Semitism, the, the EU coordinator. There's In Europe, they've been uh, sluggish, if not non-committal, in their struggle to in the struggle to ban Hezbollah, there's I know there's been some progress, but also the Muslim Brotherhood in Germany and Europe. Can you comment on that? Like, what, why, why is it so difficult to ban organizations, particularly in Germany, given the sort of the overt genocidal anti-Semitism of Hezbollah, Iran, and the Muslim Brotherhood that is that that is ideologically and historically even committed to Nazism, uh, connected sure. rather to Nazism. Why, why is such a slow response what what's what are the interests stopping such an obvious way to curtail anti-semitism sure i see Ephraim zorov is on the call thanks for joining my uh very uh leading international expert of anti-semitism it's uh, it's an honor that Ephraim's on the call i've learned a lot from him over the years um i think um well the question of felix klein is he's a civil servant who is who I've been told is a very nice guy, and he's taken some good positions on um, on the on the on on you know sort of low hanging fruit I should say, um, not on the on the the most dangerous form of anti semitism in Europe, which is the Iranian regime, and as a civil servant who works for the uh, German government, he has to largely mirror those views and. Um, <clears throat> that's what the Wiesenthal Center has has told me in its criticism of Klein. Uh, Rabbi Cooper said that he can't go beyond his mandate, and his mandate is is to comply with the per the perimeters or the constraints of the German government. So when you have <clears throat> Iran's regime calling for the destruction of Israel or the supreme leader Ali Khamenei tweeting for the destruction of Israel, suddenly Felix Klein goes silent. But Felix Klein did criticize anti-Semitism in the US a few years ago. So the German government will allow him to criticize anti-Semitism in an advanced modern democracy with, with, anti with problems of anti-Semitism, but will not allow Felix Klein to criticize the top state sponsor of Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. So it's essentially a problem of uh, Angela Merkel. In terms of the EU commissioner, to fight anti-Semitism, it's the same problem. She's limited by uh, the constraints of the EU, which won't allow her to call for the abolition of Hezbollah. The EU has not uh, banned the entire uh, anti-Semitic terrorist movement Hezbollah within the EU. And I've asked her many times and, uh, and I reported on her and she sent me sort of a boilerplate comment, which suggests again that she has her own personal view, but uh, cannot publicly say as the EU commissioner that the EU should uh, abolish all of Hezbollah. Okay, so. thanks. thanks, Benny. Ephraim, welcome. Ephraim, do you want to ask a question to Benny? You're, sorry, you're on mute, Ephraim. Um, you know, I, in a certain sense, I have some sympathy with Felix Klein because it's obvious that he can't take on this issue. In other words, it's the government that's stopping him. In other words, he's never been shy about calling out anti-Semitism. And he's trying, and in my opinion, he's, he's doing a fairly good job inside Germany. But of course, the problem is that there's no comparison between an anti-Semitic uh, event on the streets of Berlin or of, uh, Frankfurt or Cologne and, or, and a regime which wants to destroy the state of Israel. I mean, this, this is, you know, it's, it's absurd that the Germans have not taken the steps necessary to say once and for all, you know what? Totally unacceptable. You should be kicked out of the UN. You should, there should be a total world boycott of all Iranian goods, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not happening. So, you know, Simon Wiesenthal once said, or actually said it many times, that part of the problem was that no one took uh, Hitler seriously initially. 
But we as a people who've been the victims of genocide can't afford that luxury anymore. And I mean, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to see that these people are preparing rockets, ballistic missiles, and, and unfortunately, a nuclear, a nuclear device. So I'm with Benny all the way, but I don't think Felix Klein is the address for the problem. He's not the problem. Who do you think is the problem? Angela, no, he's right. He's right. It's Angela Merkel. And it all begins and ends with her. But she's, she's history soon. So the question is, what is going to be the stance of her successor? Will, will the, um, her party maintain the premiership? And this is not clear, by the way. In other words, probably, but not maybe. Ben, Benny probably knows better than me. And I'd be curious to know what his, uh, what his um, forecast is for the next German election. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really bad in terms of the business of, of predictive powers. Um, and I, when it comes to power politics, I'm frequently wrong. Um, but I, I think the new, the Merkel's party just elected a new uh, chairperson, Armin uh, Laschet, who's the, uh, the governor of Germany's most populous state. Um, you know, he has some very troubling views uh, that where he's expressed, I guess, what, what folks would consider some anti-Americanism, criticizing the Americans for uh, wanting to uh, oust uh, the genocidal dictator of Syria, Bashar Assad. And he's also been viewed as being uh, pro-Russian. He uh, supports uh, Merkel's uh, Nord Stream 2 project with Putin. Um, so, I, you know, in terms of anti-Semitism, I sent some press queries to him years ago to see whether he would take the initiative to abolish Hezbollah in his own state before the German government did. And he, he dodged all my questions. So I, I don't see um, on these large issues of Iran and, and trade, I don't see there being much of a change. Um, Germany is just deeply wedded to the Islamic Republic of Iran. And um, the critics say uh, German leaders have not internalized the lessons of the Holocaust. And the, the ultimate litmus test is the Islamic Republic of Iran and whether Germany will break ties and uh, embrace Israel's um, policy toward Iran. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about uh, the new, about where these German elections are going. Okay, thank you, Benny and Ephraim. Would anybody like, uh, anybody else like to ask a question? Perhaps please raise your hand and Ira will be able to turn on your mic, I think. You can also post a question in the chat if you don't want to speak, you can type it. Anybody like to ask a question? Bob, you can uh, go Hello. ahead if you. I see your hand. Thanks up. a lot, Ira. Uh, good, good morning from New York. Uh, I have a question about free speech. You know, it seems that um, uh, the BDS movement is being denied free speech. That's their defense. I, I don't. I don't. And yet, here in America our president is denied free speech. And it seems that the same people who defend BDS are the same people who won't, who, who take away uh, Trump's right to free speech and the right of his 75 million supporters to hear him. Uh, any comment on that? Well, I mean, I, I can address the, the, um, the, the BDS free speech issue. I mean, the, the issue of um, social media and, and uh, Twitter's uh, elimination of uh, Trump's uh, Twitter feed and other conservatives is sort of out of my, uh, my bandwidth because I'm just not that well versed in it. Um, and the, the, I mean, what, what I, it's a good question, Robert. Uh, you know, it's the Germans, so many Germans and I'm, uh, 
complain, bitterly complain about how their free speech rights are being quashed in terms of the anti-BDS resolution. But the anti-BDS resolution doesn't exercise any control over free speech rights. I mean, if you, if, if I speak German and I read German and, you know, I, I spent 20 years immersing myself in German newspapers and news shows, those news organizations and forums and you know, university uh, panels are filled with actors who slam Israel every single day. I mean, German society is packed full of the most intense anti-Israeli criticism that you'll experience outside of Iran. Iran's probably the only exception um, in terms of the high, this high intensity level of criticism targeting Israel. So again, what this suggests to me is it's not a question of free speech. There's something else sort of bubbling beneath the surface. And I think that's when you get into the realm of what Adorno and Horkheimer, uh, these two sort of master thinkers talk, talk to, you know, wrote about and other thinkers in terms of the response to the Holocaust. And that's why you see so many Germans and media organizations beating up on Israel because um, again, to use this, this, this line, they won't forgive the Israelis or Israel for the Holocaust. So this is a way to turn Israel into a human punching bag. And the whole notion that free speech is being uh, degraded is utter nonsense because as I said, the anti-BDS resolution does not target speech. It simply is a declaration. There's no penalties involved. Um, and there's no, there, there are no penalties in Germany right now for uh, criticizing Israel or anti-Israeli conduct. Um, now, BDS, the, what Germany could do, and this is not targeting speech, but it's what the US has done. I don't know where you're from, uh, um, Robert, but you know, the over 25 states who have passed uh, anti-BDS measures where companies can't, uh, you know, the, the state will not work with a company or invest in a company that's doing BDS activity. You know, these types of economic measures, um, th those measures target conduct, not speech. And Germany's done nothing along those lines. I mean, for all of the praise Germany's received in terms of its anti-BDS resolution, there's not one economic uh, measure out there that would punish a German company for its anti for its pro BDS conduct in contrast to the US. So um, I, I guess the, the free speech issue I, I have to I link that in many ways with the with contemporary anti Semitism that is, you know, we feel repressed by Jews in Israel, and we feel repressed by Israeli newspapers or Jewish newspapers, because they're threatening our free speech. It's all nonsense. I mean, Again, it's, 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 it's the same people who are saying this, and many of them are journalists, write for you know, large media organizations where they make these arguments in those media organizations, and then they complain, my free speech is being quashed. So I, I, you know, I, how do you explain that disconnect and that type of you know, distorted thinking that's based on pure fantasy? There's only one way to explain it from my perspective, and that's the A word. So I see we have a comment here. Yeah, there's um, actually, Ellen has been waiting patiently. And oh, sorry. Two questions. Yeah, go ahead. So Ellen, and then we'll get to the comments in the chat. Yes, thank you. It's been a fascinating hour. Thank you very much. Uh, the comment that you made that some Germans blame Jews for anti-Semitism, you've covered some of it, but um, is there a, a larger group that really believe this? Um, I mean, there, there have been no sophisticated... I mean, there have been there have been ADL questionnaires um, that that try to glean this type of semitism, and you can read these different studies that come out. But it's um, I think there have been, in my view, no intensive, long-term studies that really try to address uh, how ubiquitous this form of anti-semitism is. And again, the anti-Semitism that I tend to focus on because I think it's the most widespread in Germany <laughs> is this notion of secondary anti-Semitism or guilt defensiveness anti-Semitism where um, because of this, this enormous amount of pathological guilt, 
Germans will, many Germans will blame Israel, will blame Jews for all these problems that are somehow linked to Jews or Israel, whether it's German media organizations or Germans counting the number of Jews in this Republican administration, this Democratic administration, and trying to single out whether these Jews played a role in any wars or have any interventionist policies or mm -hmm. might be anti-German because their families survived the Holocaust. There's all this type of uh, um, very unsavory thinking that plays out in the German media. And when you just talk to so-called normal Germans, as I have over the years, mm -hmm. and I, I, I can assure you it's the numbers are extraordinarily high in terms of the, the uh, in terms of Germans who um, the percentage of Germans who will um, blame <clears throat> Israel for the most um, outrageous and and false um, crimes and it's more outrageous and, and the numbers higher in Germany in my view again because of this notion we have to cleanse our <clears throat> emotions of this feeling of being uh, of, of Holocaust complicity because of our family descendants, et cetera. <clears throat> now it sounds very so social psychological and it is, but I have no, there's no other compelling explanation out there for me for why the number, the percentage of, of, um, <clears throat> of, of why anti-Semitism is still so widespread in Germany. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the crude right-wing anti-Semitism, of, of the Nazis. <clears throat> I'm talking about anti-Semitism in response to the Holocaust. So <clears throat> the, um, your question is very, very good. I just can't provide a, an analytical answer to it, but I can tell you based on my 20 years of experience in Germany that it's, in, uh, it's quite widespread. If you talk to Germans, the famous German Jewish author, Henrik Broder, who's written about this in German, who has spent over, you know, he grew up in Germany, he's in his 70s, He's had much more experience with this. I think he would concur with me about how widespread this notion of uh, guilt defensiveness anti-Semitism is and how very, very dangerous it is. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Ellen, thanks, Benny. So one more quick question because we're running out of time from Trisha. She can, says, can what was- more questions? Because I see uh, a couple, or Eva also has a question. Yeah, okay. you see it in the chat, Benny? Uh, yeah, I see a Trisha yeah. question and then something from Eva. Yeah, okay. So Trisha asks, what was Germany's position before Merkel? And I assume Germany is one of the most, one of the nations denying funding to UNRWA on the basis of the pay for slave program or the Palestinian textbooks. You want to respond? Well, as I understand the question, Germany is not, is still funding UNRWA and increased its funding. So, right, Germany, if I understand the question, correctly is not, did not uh, like the US uh, pull the plug, plug on UNRWA funding because of, um, uh, because uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, pays terrorists a, a stipend who, who murder Israelis and who's, so Germany's done the opposite, is, is deeply wedded to these UN organizations um, that are also, uh, who have been accused of anti-Semitism. And Germany has shown has showed no interest in, in reforming these UN organizations. As I've mentioned, uh, the German government funds NGOs and uh, and German political parties fund NGOs who, who who work in Israel and the disputed territories that have ties to Palestinian terrorist organizations. Um, Mer the position before Merkel was Gerhard Schroeder was the Chancellor of Germany, a Social Democrat. Um, and I should note, you know, that Merkel and Schroeder did, you know, provide uh, help with uh, submarines that were uh, sold to Israel, which uh, have second strike capability, uh, namely can be used, can be, um, these submarines can, uh, are, are nuclear weapon capable submarines um, based on the Israeli technology. So there are some, there have been some positives of the, the Schroeder and Merkel um, governments, but, um, you know, yes, you know, that's nice. But again, you know, uh, this is a, 
you know, country that uh, wiped out almost, I think, half of the world's Jewish population during the uh, during the Holocaust. So submarines are great, but there's so much more that um, critics say Germany could be doing if it if Germany was was reached a high level of consciousness about its responsibility toward the Jewish people and the state of Israel. Um, it's uh, and and the UN question is one of many questions where Germany could be doing a lot more, and um, certainly uh, uh, BDS and uh, anti-terrorism uh, activity. Now I see there's a question from Eric Seidel or yeah. So Eva, very quickly, Eva was next. Free speech is a right incumbent only upon the government or its agencies. Private companies do not have, do not allow free speech. I don't know if you want to comment on that comment or. Yeah, I mean I, that according to U.S. law, I, I guess that's uh, that's how it works in the U.S. That's based on my memory of growing up in, in the U.S. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, but of course, free speech in in European countries in Israel is regulated and uh, it has a it's a different cap. So. Uh, you know, free speech in Germany is eliminated, right? Holocaust denial is free is not is not protected by free speech as we would know as 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 we would know based on the First Amendment. Um, now, here's the trick or the or the controversy: when German neo Nazis deny the Holocaust, the German government will, as a rule, enforce the their law against uh, the denial of Holocaust. But when the Iranian regime shows up in Germany, and I've I've uh, documented two instances of Iranian regime figures who were welcomed by the German government and denied the Holocaust. The German government chose not to prosecute them, although they could have been prosecuted. So how do you explain Germany's disconnect between prosecuting homegrown German neo-Nazis but ignoring Iranian regime Islamists when it comes to Holocaust denial? Again, um, very bizarre and uh, it shows a lack of, uh, of consciousness about uh, um, fighting anti-Semitism from my perspective. Now, the, there's a question I see from Eric. Yeah, so Eric asks, what do you think about the perception that ever since the Jews have gained a way to successfully defend themselves vis-a-vis -vis Israel, that, it, that, is, that this is much uh, behind of the spreading of anti-Semitism today? Well, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, Eric, I think, you know, anti-Semitism causes anti-Semitism, right? Or anti-Semitism breeds anti-Semitism. And Jews defending themselves in Israel or um, it is not, uh, obviously, and I, I know you know this, is not a form of, of anti-Semitism. What I think what gets folks bent out of shape is, yes, there's this uh, European view of, uh, of uh, you know, young uh, of Jews sitting in cafes in Vienna and Munich and Berlin, and you know, uh, writing German poetry and reading Heine, and this is the the sort of traditional view of um, or of, uh, of of many Europeans have of Jews, or or, or they have views of uh, you know a fiddler on the roof, or uh, you know singing in in some shtetl. Uh, in Eastern Europe, and they don't tend to, you know, see, uh, understand that uh, the Jewish people have had a long history of self-defense and uh, military prowess going back to biblical times. So, but there is a sense that, and, and, and I've given this some thought, and it's a very naughty uh, um, phenomenon, and, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I, I, I'd like to write more about this, that the, the idea that Jews who, for example, the 1967 war, when, when Israel defeated multiple Arab armies, suddenly the German left, which was largely pro-Israel or not anti-Israel, I should say, up until 1967, the German left suddenly turned and became anti-Israel. How does one explain that? Because Israel defeated a series of anti-Semitic armies from the Arab world, the German left, in 1967, switched sides. Now, what is that about? Again, th these are good questions, and I don't have the answers to them, but there's something very 
deeply weird and deeply odd that for years since the establishment of the state of Israel, the German left, which is a size, which has a size, which had a sizable presence back in the 60s, suddenly moved from being sympathetic toward Israel to being fiercely anti-Israel and deeply anti-Semitic after Israel um, won the 1967 uh, war. I think, so we're, we're out of time. We've actually gone a bit over, but I'll just make one quick comment. I'm not sure if it's odd that the left switched in 1967 from being pro-Israel or quiet, quiet on the issue and they switched to being anti-Israel. Perhaps um, the, the anomaly was from 1945 to 1967 that German intellectuals were not anti-Jewish or anti-Israel, given the legacy of anti-Semitism that is so deeply endemic in the society, in the civilization, in the religion, in the philosophy, in the science. Um, I'm not so surprised, that, but that is a whole other question or debate. So Benny, thank you. Thank you very much for coming back and presenting your, your presentations and your work is, is very important, so thank you. And I'll just end by saying, if anybody is interested, I'm starting this course today at 2 p.m. New York time, you're welcome to join. Tomorrow, David Patterson, who is an expert on the Holocaust, but also on political Islam and, and fascism. He's starting a course at noon tomorrow, uh, New York time. It's Both courses are four sessions for once a week. We'll meet once a week for four weeks. I'll be meeting at two on Tuesdays and David Patterson at noon on Wednesdays. On January the 25th, uh, which is next week, we have a seminar series in Arabic, which is run by our colleague Rami Aziz. And Rami will be hosting Mohammed Al Hamadi, who's the editor in chief of the Emirati Daily El Rion uh, newspaper. He's also um, the chair of the uh, Emirati Journalists uh, Association. And um, on the 26th, we have a Spanish seminar series that's going on that's hosted by Pedro Gonzalez. And we have the um, Luis Surziki, and he is an activist, speaker, and writer from uh, Argentina. And he's also, he works for the AMIA, that's the Jewish institution that was uh, blown up by Iranian terrorists. And he'll, the title of his talk is The AMIA Crime, A Personal Journey. So that's next Tuesday at um, 11 a.m. New York time. So we have a crowded schedule. You can go to our website and see all of this, uh, all these programs and we'll have more programs coming online. So thank you everybody for attending. It's nice to see familiar faces. And Benny, thank you so much for your insights and uh, your continued uh, knowledge producing uh, seminars and writing. You're, you're thanks, uh, thanks to everybody who participated. I see my colleague, David Mays on the call. I want to thank him for joining from FTD. And if folks have any questions, um, uh, let me see, I'll type in my email here um, and you can send me uh, questions or if you need any help with resources. Uh, David, thanks for joining. Thank David you, is there. also a very important uh, BDS uh, expert. If folks need any information on BDS in the United States, uh, David's on the... Uh, um, you can, I can send, David, what's your email? You have to go off mute. David May at FDD.org. Let me just punt that in here. David May at FDD.org, right? Correct. So David, just by folks quickly know, is an expert on BDS in the United States and, and among uh, the, the Arab boycott of Israel. And he's also available for any uh, questions or, or information. So thanks everybody for the questions and stay healthy. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Benny, do you want to stay on? Yeah. Cool. So it's